Five rivers, the land in which the ancient Vedas were composed. It is known to be the granary of the country. And most people generally forget that Punjab has also been the ancient land of knowledge. The grand university of Takshashila, the ruins of it which lies in the western part of Punjab, which after 1947 went to Pakistan, but still it remains a part of that cultural aspect of Punjab. So this trail, this sojourn of ours, the higher education forums, this is the maiden in this series. Chandigarh we chose because of this, uh, uh, I would say, prestigious reasons. After Chandigarh, this higher education forum would be convened in Chennai, in Pune, and it will all converge at New Delhi with the release of a major campus preparedness survey report, a mammoth exercise which was conducted in the last 100 years 100 days. Uh, since the inception of Engineering Watch, the quest had been, uh, we had recognized the entrepreneurs, we had identified the various stakeholders of higher education of the country. A lot of deliberation was keep on happening across on many forums. A lot of stereotypes about India's yeah. higher education and higher technical education in particular got built up. A 2004 kind of a report, the statistics that one out of four are employable still continues. So at Engineering Watch we felt, what is it really ailing the higher education system of the country? It somewhere got a fillip in the year 2000 when the private institutions started coming in. If we look at the largest statistics in just 15 years time, we have one of the largest higher education systems across the world. Despite all that, there is a lot of concern, there is a lot of uh, queries and things like that. So we felt, why not explore the maniki bath of all these campuses across and give them a platform, give them a forum where they can express themselves openly, they can come out with their vivid views, not bucketizing their views into certain, uh, certain notions which generally don't work in this country where we have just one time zone but so many cultural zones and mind zones. Here I will say Satsri Akal, day after tomorrow in Chennai I have to say Vanakkam. So the higher education system per se has its own challenges and own constraints and things like that. So we were in the process of thinking of documenting, surveying and finding out as to what actually are the key core vices of the higher education fraternity across the country. A similar quest was probably going on in the mind of Raj Mrityun Jhapa, who is uh, the managing director of Campus Management India, who looks after the Asia Pacific operations, the Middle East operations. So somewhere he was also trying to understand as to what dynamics of India's higher education system are actually working. We had been in touch with them and all, we sent a proposal and things clicked up and then he said, why not let's do it, let's try to unravel the hidden mysteries, unravel the real challenges and the real goals which the higher education institutions of the country have set out for themselves and also try to find out what are the, what are the uh, preparedness of these campuses amidst the global emerging challenges. Globally higher education with the advent of technology a lot many uh, uh, lot many things are coming up, lot many trends are coming across. So merging the passion and the rigor of Engineering Watch to serve the higher education space of the country and the global expertise of campus management having served a large number of US universities in particular and really strategizing them, helping them out to meet out their goals and challenges. Uh, this campus preparedness survey was conceived it, it got uh, administered to a, uh, to a lot of around 500 top-notch institutions in India. We know we have us three larger genres of institutions. At the top we have the IITs, NITs and other premier institutions, around 100 in number. Then we have a whole lot of private universities and the deemed to be universities, around 300 in number. And then we have these illustrious uh, 
state technical universities who are affiliating to the tune of 3,500 colleges, higher technical institutions across the country. We have at least one engineering college in at least in 412 districts of this country. So it's a massive footprint which this country has seen. I would like to welcome Professor R. L. Sharma, the Honorable Vice Chancellor of uh, Himachal Pradesh Technical University, who has graced us this occasion. So before we move on, I would request uh, uh, Raj to come over and just share as to what was transgressing in his mind in, in, in curating this whole exercise of campus preparedness and what he means by that and what has been his experience. Thank you, Raghu, and uh, welcome all of you once again. Thank you for coming down and uh, joining us. Uh, we feel very privileged to have all of you here together. Uh, we did this exercise that started for us over 100 days ago uh, when we actually put the thought of let's go out and reach out to campuses and we said we tried to reach out to over 500 of them. And uh, over a period of time, you know, we've been successful in uh, looking at this from four different regions. And uh, this first one is, uh, you know, we decided that we should reach a bigger. And i got to tell you that I've been very impressed with the city. And, uh, it's, uh, it's planning and, you know, I think this is uh, uh, going to be a really fantastic education hub. Uh, to say whether it is the bigger itself or around this region is going to be a fantastic education hub. Uh, talking about uh, this uh, uh, event, uh, you know, we've been, um, campus management has uh, been operating in several countries um, and we've been actually in India for quite quite some time. Um, but we predominantly looked at, uh, looked in India as a more center of developing uh, really good, sophisticated solutions to cater to the global markets. Uh, and uh, we have effectively at that point uh, looked at, you know, we have, uh, like in America, we have uh, close to 60% market share in terms of the for-profit education where we implemented our campus management solutions. Uh, these include the likes of Kaplan and, you know, bridge points of the world, uh, where some of the largest institutions, and also, I know some of you here are from defense background, uh, Defense Academy University, which is uh, one of the largest universities from a number standpoint. North America as well. So we have been engaged in America, we've been engaged in Middle East, we've been engaged in several other countries, but again, all of us sitting out of here were uh, in, in collaboration with our global teams out of America and everywhere else, uh, we were doing that. When we started looking at saying, we, we should do something in here for this country, we should actually take this as a solution and address this market, our first one that we went after was actually National Skill Development Corporation, NSDC, and hopefully most of you are familiar with NSDC and the government schemes and what they're doing. Uh, we are the company that has built the entire backbone of infrastructure for the entire NSDC program that is managed. Which means from uh, the process of recruiting the partners for the NSDC program uh, all the way through the candidate assessment and uh, getting the benefit, benefit uh, the financial benefit to the bank account. That whole program is managed on our system. The reason why we went after and did that was because we wanted to understand the complexity of how dynamic this market is um, and uh, the challenges this market brings in. And so that was one facet of what we call as education in this country. The second one, of course, is higher education, um, and which is some of you here represent the higher education. And to come in and actually provide systems and solutions for higher education, it was important for us to understand exactly what are your pain points, what are your challenges, because it differs from market to market, it differs from country to country, by geography to geography, and something that, uh, as we did the survey, has shown to us very clearly, it changes from the, each part of the country to other part of the country. That's also quite interesting, is uh, the ch challenges that you see in north are not the same challenges in south versus not the same challenges in the west, of, uh, in the west part of the country. So that again is quite uh, interesting for us as we went to it. So we actually looked at this as a, uh, for us as a market understanding, but at the same time bring people, bring you all together, the like-minded people who are in this industry, and learn with you in terms of how we can actually revolutionize this. As a country, obviously we have, um, you know, uh, the new government has set out a very clear vision in terms of where it has to be. And at least on the education side, I can say there is no one government that has left this behind. Every government, successive government, obviously has looked at education as an important element because of the age demographics and the fact that we have to provide so much more employment. 
But what is look if you look at what is changing globally, and one of the things that we see, which you know, working with several countries, what is changing globally, is how education is measured, and that is something that we would like to work with every one of you to build that kind of a system here. The way education is evolving, for example, is that it's no more going to be subject based; it is going to be competency based. Right? That is one of the biggest changes that you're going to see, which is actually revolving, and most countries are actually adopting this methodology. And I was actually quite surprised. I was in um, you know, Middle East uh, three weeks ago, and I heard that Saudi Arabia is going to close down 20 universities and open up 50 competency-based centers. I was actually quite surprised. I said, that is a very bold move. You know? and, and so there are uh, that kind of a trend that we see in the global world that they, they aggressively move towards that. Indonesia is setting up that kind of model. And there is no reason why India cannot actually set that up. And it is all about evolving the current model. It's not a reset model. It's how do we evolve this current model to actually put those kind of systems in place. So campus management has obviously worked with several uh, institutions globally. Over 2,000 campuses globally have uh, adopted our solutions. Uh, this includes from the likes of Harvard and London School of Economics to IIM Udaipur in India to several other institutions. And uh, we look at this as an opportunity for us to be able to educate um, and learn and uh, share our knowledge through this process. Um, and, uh, you know, hopefully at the end of all this, um, you will take back a few valuable pointers and we will take back a few things and we can continue to, you know, uh, engage on a periodic basis and see how we can take this further. Some um, data points that I thought you would like, love to hear, um, you know, in terms of top five priority things that we saw from a national survey standpoint. Again, we're going to release the national survey data uh, only in New Delhi, which is going to be on the 2nd of April. Uh, but at least from a zonal level, you're going to get to see a lot more information today. But from a national level, one of the first things that we learned was uh, the top most priority for every institution, or at least 75 or 85% of the institutions, is actually building uh, efficiencies of the faculty. That was actually 85% of the institutions said faculty efficiency is actually my top most priority. And that is actually quite interesting for us because you know when you look at how do you do that? Uh, you know, you can actually do that in various different ways. And several of these institutions actually mentioned they're implementing tools, they're implementing workflows, they're implementing platforms to actually build the kind of efficiency. So that's something we feel is very consistent. We feel is very consistent across many other countries that we work with as well. The second top most priority is about cons you know, consolidating infrastructure. And again, this is something you know which uh, um, in in. Uh, Few countries where infrastructure is uh, looked at in a larger point of view, not just in terms of building. Uh, you talk about infrastructure as in classrooms, your boards, your uh, you know your buses, the shuttle buses that you run. And if you look at it from a larger perspective as an in infrastructure, uh, you'd be quite surprised to know that globally only 21% is actually utilized. Um, is uh, so there is a lot of infrastructure that can be leveraged more. And this can be done in terms of blending education. I mean, these, obviously, the generation of students that are there now are well versed with online, they're well versed with a lot of these things. I don't think online education can take over tomorrow and just say that's going to be the future. I think there is going to be some of the blending that can happen, which will actually help you uh, effectively utilize some of the infrastructure. Again, number two on the list was consolidating infrastructure. Number three that we saw was improved uh, ranking. And again, close to 80% of the institutions said, I want to improve my institutional ranking. And uh, that is quite interesting for us because you know, that's one of the reasons why a lot of uh, uh, billboards these days say, I'm among the top three when it comes to commerce. I'm, among, I'm one of the top three when it comes to science. I'm uh, the top one when it comes to this one. So you see billboards like that when it comes down to the time of admission process. And the reason you're stating those things is because you want to attract the best, the brightest, or you know, make sure that you're getting all the students in. Um, and obviously improving ranking is not, that is just one parameter. And there are several other parameters that goes into it. And I, uh, we are very intrigued that this is a, a priority area for you. Because that's one of the things that uh, you know, we, we do work with you in, in uh, consulting with you and helping you drive that. Focus on research, 78% uh, you know, have uh, uh, looked at that as a number four uh, from an order of priority. Um, and uh, again, over 50% of them are implementing tools, are uh, implementing uh, automated workflows uh, to track the entire research activity from the entire life cycle standpoint. 
Again, this is something which we felt uh, is quite interesting. There is tons of research funds available, but the flow is not there. And even for the research activity going on, the tracking is not uh, up to the point. How do you track that? How do you measure the grants? How do you keep track of it? How do you report back? Uh, there are tons of grants available. I'm, uh, I'm sure somebody from the defense background here, if they are up here, they can talk to you more. Uh, there's a lot of funds available on the research side uh, from, the, from the defense side. So the funds are available. It's how do you utilize those funds? How do you develop that? How do you track it? How do you measure it? How do you set up a governance structure? There seems to be a lot of challenge there. And lastly on the top five was uh, enhancing placement. I mean, obviously, it shouldn't come as a surprise that placement is one of the top most uh, uh, you know, priorities among the top five. And again, 73%, interestingly, 27% don't think this is the highest priority, but it doesn't mean it's at the bottom of the pyramid. But 73% think that's actually a very high priority for them. So if you look at just those five parameters, and I can tell you, you know, 80% of you sitting in this room would say, yes, they would be my top five as well. Or change two to three, three to one, they'll fall into my top five as well. So when we have that as a commonality across these institutions, how do we actually take this and develop it? How do we actually create systems and processes and workflows <laughs> that can actually enhance all the organizations to go up the value chain? That's what we are interested to do. That's what we're interested to engage with you. And uh, we look at this as a great opportunity. I would like to thank Engineering Works, uh, Engineering Watch, uh, for engaging with us. And like we said, uh, uh, two minds have to meet in order to make something like this happen. And uh, it has taken a lot of effort. In fact, uh, the summary that uh, Raghav just gave uh, and, and Ravi here to give you is uh, an understatement, if I tell you, that each one of these interviews have taken us over two to three hours. Uh, to come up and actually get this data to them. And this is a humongous effort that has happened. Um, weeks and days of many, many people conducting interviews across many parts of India, uh, culminating this into one single report. And you probably will get a copy of the uh, abstract from the north that you will get to see. And consolidating all of that into three page is not an easy task. Uh, but at least that's just the starting point. We would like to give you the complete report on 2nd of April uh, and encourage you all to come in. Even if you cannot make it, we'll be happy. You know, if you could call us, we'll be happy to come down, personally meet you, share with you the report, and uh, talk to you more about uh, how we can jointly, collectively work together. And we would like to keep this forum alive. We would like this is not our idea is not to do this and take your names and run from here. We would like to keep this forum alive. We'd like to come back and re-engage and continue to work together uh, in building up the quality and you know growing this industry uh, along with you. So once again. Uh, thank you. My lot of team, my team members are around here, um, you know, from campus management as well as from engineering watch. We consider them as our team member. Although we like to say they have completely kept the research independent, we have not been able to influence them. Um, so you know, we, we have we completely respect that uh, what they have done, and uh, welcome you all, and look forward to having a great evening. Thank you. Where we just uh, take on things. So a lot of. Uh, a uh, lot of minds, a lot of key keywords, a lot of things have emerged out of it and uh, some of it will be uh, coming uh, slowly on that. So building on the findings of it and also linking up uh, with the national narratives, uh, the agenda of today's higher education forum is threefold. Uh, we have uh, structured it into three uh, sessions probably and this is not something we want it uh, this versus that, it's a whole forum per se. It's just that there are some people selected to catalyze the whole conversation. Uh, the first deliberation which we have kept for the evening is the key challenges and challengers for the growth of higher education industry. Now you would be quite a pal that why we are using the word industry per se. Now this is quite interesting that out of the whole uh, conversation which we had, a mere 55% of the institutions across the country say that revenue growth is one of their top priority. Now this is quite an understatement. And on the top it is further furthering the effectiveness of the faculty. So these two are quite dichotomous at times. So this is one key how the higher education system which is increasingly getting privately funded until or unless it is a revenue growth target in terms of it, in terms of getting more grants, in terms of having more consulting projects, the various other dimensions. So they don't match up. So that's why we have said that until or unless higher education per se is seen more as an industry, uh, it's, it's still a debate like today the Honorable Supreme Court squashed the section 66A of the IT Act saying that it is unconstitutional and it curbs the freedom of expression. So maybe in today's forum uh, with our eminent panelists on board, 
uh, we would be able to deliberate more on this aspect of higher education in the country. If the quality of higher education in this country has to improve and if higher education has to really contribute to the national gross domestic product and the economic upfront using uh, technological innovations. So what, how it should be structured, how it should be seen from a policy perspective, uh, really maintaining the socialist mandate of a non-for-profit uh, item or it can be worked out in a different manner. So these are some of the opening points which I will leave open for our eminent panelists for this. I would like to invite uh, Professor A.D.N. Vajpayee, uh, the Honorable Vice Chancellor of the HP University uh, to please come on the dais. Uh, Professor A.D.N. Vajpayee. Uh, we also have with us Dr. Sanjay Modi, uh, the Executive Dean uh, from the lovely professional university. I would also like to invite uh, Dr. R.L. Sharma, the Honorable Vice Chancellor of the Himachal Pradesh Technical University. Uh, we also have with us, uh, to give this uh, entire deliberation a key punch, Mr. Kumara Guru, uh, who is the Director of External Relations with the Indian School of Business, Mohali. I would also like to invite uh, Mr. Sophie Zahoor, uh, who is Director of HR with the Quark Express, uh, a leading publishing uh, software organization based out of Chandigarh. And on behalf of campus management, I would like to invite Mr. Mohit Fogart uh, to share his views and uh, things. Uh, we, uh, before I, uh, I request all the panelists to give up their opening notes, how it will work is like for five, five and up, uh, because we are quite pressed for time and all. So for five minutes, they can give up their opening remarks on this subject as to what in their opinion are the key challenges and challengers uh, for the growth of higher education industry. Now they can pick up their own views and things like that. And uh, once they have uh, done up with their opening remarks, we will uh, keep the house open uh, for conversations from the audience. It's, it's like one forum, we don't want to keep it two sides of the stuff over there. Uh, before I just request, uh, uh, Mr. Mohit forgot to give up his opening remarks uh, because uh, that's where he want to trickle it across because Raj used a term like for-profit higher education in the United States. In India we still don't have that legal structure per se. So that's somewhere I would request him to open up. I would request our associate uh, in Chandigarh, the friend of Engineering Watch, Mr. Gaurav to, uh, to give up stools and welcome formally all our panelists, uh, Mr. Gaurav Garg. I request uh, uh, Dr. Sanjay Modi to accept our welcome in the form of this uh, uh, ceremonial stool. Dr. R.L. Sharma to please accept a uh, token of welcome from our side. Mr. Kumara Guru. Uh, जब आपको दो तारीख को ये रिपोर्ट मिलेगी, तो उसमें भांती भांती के रंग और भांती भांती के फीचर्स यू विल फाइंड आउट। That was the whole point in Punjab is a land of colours, so we uh, culled out a lot of colours. Mr. Sophie Zahoor uh, to be welcomed by Mr. Gaurav Gar with the ceremonial stool. <coughs> And lastly, Mr. Mohit Fogart uh, from Campus Management. So you can keep wearing it across, it will be good photo app <laughs> over there. So I request Mohit to just quickly give up his opening comments on the topic, uh, the key challenges and challenges in his opinion for the growth of higher education industry in India per se. I look at it from the perspective of three key, stores, key uh, stakeholders that we have, uh, essentially the sponsors who fund the institutions, the uh, institutions who are the key to uh, dispersing this knowledge to the students, and last but not the least, the users, the key, uh, uh, the key ones in the forum, uh, the students themselves. So uh, all these three entities look at it from their own perspective, though they uh, end up being in the same place. Uh, the industry uh, accepts, uh, understands, attributes, at times, accredits these institutions in their own way and find their own ways to sponsoring people. 
an institution. So uh, I, as a company in campus management, would want to sponsor a function, uh, maybe an academics of an uh, of an of an institution, and say uh, maybe an NDP program for the least. Uh, I would want to uh, give placements to students, assuming a stu an institution to be good or bad in my own opinion. So I become opinionated, opinionated in one way or the other. At the same time, an institution, uh, and maybe in fact a student first, chooses an institution based upon his own attributes, his own uh, internal, his own learnings from uh, his ambience, his parents, his, his friends, his seniors, as to which college is good or bad, um, outside the sphere of IITs and IITs and the bigger institutions. But then an institution, at the end of the day, uh, has to disperse all these fictional notions of the industry and the students per se. They are the ones who need to inculcate all these ambience uh, in entities and give out a strata to the social, uh, to the society outside, which is better off than a student when he came internally. So outside this nature of a set of intelligent students who imbibe a better institution, we have a huge set of students who come from uh, post uh, I mean, these primary and secondary education sectors of state and central government bodies, which are the 90% set of people not very intelligent, not very well English spoken, not very well coming from the rich or the upper middle classes of the society. Are they, are they really being transformed? Are the institutions doing enough to transform them to become the uh, people who can be very well consumed by the industry? I would say partially yes, uh, partially no strongly no. The intent being, is the institution doing enough? Is the child being developed enough to be accepted by industry? Is the faculty being not just uh, forced to teach well, but are they, are they able to evaluate the effectiveness of, effectiveness of the faculty? I believe yes, I believe no. So to, to be a challenger and to be challenged enough, I sincerely feel that besides other agencies by besides other storms which might be coming in and influencing all these factors, technology becomes a very important factor which enables you to know what's happening around you. Not just in terms of uh, giving a better operational efficiency and efficacy, but also to know uh, from the data points besides you how they themselves can be improving themselves and, and transform. Tra trans uh, Thanks, Mike. Uh, I, would, I would request uh, Mr. Zahoor uh, to come in and give his opening remarks. Good evening, everyone here. I'm the odd man out here, all eminent you know, educationists, and, and I, I will bring my perspective from the industry. Uh, thank you very much for calling me to this uh, event. Now, before we actually get into this uh, subject of what education, how education, the methods, the delivery, I think it's one thing is very important that we need to align this, the need of an industry. So we need to understand the industry. Interestingly, the last 10 years, we've been fortunate or unfortunate enough to see this roller coasters of you know, two uh, economic slumps. We have seen two economic slump roller coasters. That was 1996, 97, and then again we saw it again in 2002, 2003. Now these two roller coasters brought phenomenal changes in the market, and we have we've been we've been experiencing it. And and these two changes, these 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 changes, actually, what it brought for an industry, and I can I can tell you, uh, number one, and that was speed for change. The customers around the world have really are expecting very quick results. You know, you can, you can, you had Nokia, one of the most respected company in the world, but but the company like Samsung came in and killed it left, right, and center. Is that because they brought the products well in the market before the use cases that customer could decide? They had the product out in the market. So speed for change was one of the paradigm shift post this roller coaster. The second thing which brought change was the very important change was that the customers became extremely demanding. <clears throat> extremely demanding. And you know, I'm, I'm sure at some point of time the companies used to have 10-15% of you know bench strengths. 
and that bank strength concept has gone out of the company. So we, so companies have actually again become extremely demanding when they go out to the campus and pick up the students because the customer has become demanding. So these are the paradigm shift which has actually happened post this roller coaster. But what has actually on the ground what has changed? <clears throat> I when I was in my school I was taught this is some basic principles which change on the business principles on the ground. I was taught survival of fittest. But in the last 10 years, I think that, that philosophy, management philosophy has changed, that business philosophy has changed, and that business philosophy has converted from survival of fittest to the survival of fastest. The other paradigm which we saw the change was from, one was survival from fittest to survival from fastest. The other thing which I was taught in my school was look before you leave. Now with this change, the customer demand, the customer become extremely demanding, the speed for change. What it brought on the ground was look as you leap from look before you leap. And the third important change which we have seen, and I will drive the point from this third point is, in the olden days, or rather maybe about five, seven years back, the route to the CEO's office, the road or route to the CEO's office was through the office of a CFO or a marketing office. That has changed. The route is not through a CFO or a CMO, it is from a CTO. Now what does this derive? This derives those companies will survive, thrive, who will invest a lot on the innovation side. So again, the research innovation has become extremely critical and important, you know, you know, when you when, when, when we go to the campuses, I can tell you we've been on a recruiting drive. And we have interviewed about 164 candidates in the last maybe one and a half month. We were able to pick only two, two candidates. The hiring ratio, the reason is that I am working for a standard mentor who is extremely demanding, so my hiring manager wants the best people on the, on the course. So I think these are the paradigm shifts which has, which has happened. So when we go to the campuses, for these higher education campuses, or any company as of today, they look for the best. Things have changed. I think. I think, uh, you know, technology can play a very good role in, in making sure, you know, making sure we meet the speed variable, which is on the efficiency side. The one of the, one, one more point I want to bring it here, I don't know whether it is relevant or not, you know, when we go to the campuses, you know, we look for two variables very critically, especially. One is the will, another is the skill. So it's very important while the candidates are very skillful, we also need to see that, you know, we also look forward rather, more than skill, if the skill is on a seven out of 10 is, is the will. So which is the effective side of the, the student. So I think that this is another area which is very critical for when we look for the you know, students. So I, essentially the companies are looking for people who are students who are innovative, they have done some research programs, their internship has been has been very serious. They are they are not just the talent. It's the it is the attitude which which it is the talent with the attitude. I mean, I understand talent. You know, I think the best example which I normally give is is Sachin Tendulkar and uh, Vinod Kamli. And if you look at look back their statistics, Vinod Kamli's statistics was much better in the first class than Sachin Tendulkar. He scored much much, much, much better, his average was much higher, his, his number of runs on the board was much higher, but what happened to the Vinod Kamli at the age of 23 when Ambrose bowled him a bouncer, he couldn't handle that bouncer, that's why the attitude needed, so he had the talent, but he did not have attitude to handle that talent, so attitude in the, in, in the, in, in this, you know, while you know Sachin, I think, it was a brilliance of his talent, but it was more brilliance of his attitude, how did he handle the, the talent. So I think that's another area which, you know, which I don't know how technology can play an important role, but it's the will and the skill amalgamation of both helps the industry, you know, to, to meet our, you know, the numbers or the targets or the kind of people we look for at universities. Those are my few cents and I think as we go we can add more. Thank you. Thanks a lot sir. Very well said. I would think that Dr. Modi would like to build upon it further like leading one of the 
largest universities in the country per se. Uh, the speed for change and other opening remarks uh, by Mohit. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. You see, you presented the uh, results of the survey, which said most of the things. And my friends from the industry have presented uh, the industry side of the story. I think, uh, especially looking at the industry perspective, and also in view of uh, comparing ourselves with the global standards, how education is being delivered globally, I think education in India needs a complete overhaul. And when I say that, I am excluding the islands of excellence, which could be IITs and IIMs. Uh, those would definitely stand apart and may be quite on track. But for the rest of the education system, I think a complete overhaul is absolutely imperative. And that is from a couple of angles. One, that education in India still remains to be student-centric. Sorry, uh, faculty strength. Largely, it is the faculty which drives. Student is not at the center of his learning. We are actually teaching. The student is actually not learning because he is not at the center. That's one major problem. And a root cause for this, I find, is that our learning outcomes of education are not properly defined. We don't know what are the learning outcomes. We never bother actually about them. We teach what we have to teach without caring what skills the industry requires and what is the right way of imparting those skills. So that to me is a very major challenge. And this emerges from the fact that our faculty at the higher education level, though in fields of education and all, they, people do in school level, B and and M and are required, but for higher education probably, uh, we do not have any kind of teacher training which accounts for largely the failure on part of the faculty to deliver what the students are expected to perform in the industry. That's one major reason. And the second, as already pointed out, is the research orientation, which leads to a, another corollary that industry, because of the lack of research orientation, doesn't actually believe in education. They don't trust the, now our degrees are not relied upon. They have a separate exam taken, entrance exam. They have took discussions, interviews, and whatnot. And probably two people selected out of 160 campuses is, is a very you know, loud commentary on the kind of education that we have. And that's largely because we are not interfacing with the industry adequately. And I would, I at times feel that uh, industry also is accountable for that, but largely I think it is the academia which has to take the first step forward and prove, demonstrate that yes, we have the capability to do something for the industry. So unless that interdependence is established, probably the industry would never believe us, the academia, and unless they interface, we probably would not know what to deliver and how to deliver to the students, which will be acceptable to the industry. And uh, for-profit issue was raised. I think that's an important point. If you have to invest in technology, I think today the biggest area of investment for the academia is technology. And uh, with the increasing pace of change of technology, I think that will remain to be a very uh, difficult area to handle. So uh, the kind of investment which goes in, probably something has to be done because it's become very complicated. The fees are what they are, the paying capacity of the Indian student is not as much. So uh, on the technology front, um, uh, it will be a challenge, but something has to be done so that more resource mobilization is, uh, in fact, Fiki at one point in time had said there should be a education finance kind of a commission, which probably has not come into being. So that would give some kind of low interest loans to the academia to be able to do something very meaningful. And the challenger which I, I see is, uh, which is absolutely frightening uh, when we read time, day in and day out and even our Honorable uh, President has been stressing this point that none of our institutions, of course one or two names we've heard in the recent past, they won't appear in the global rankings. That is absolutely a major blow, a challenger to the academia. What do we do? How do we figure out the way of getting listed? Because we are completely off track. The criteria which they have 
for rankings, we don't actually follow that. We don't respect that. We are not even on track to achieve on any of those parameters. So that's a major challenge and that gives a complex to all Indian education institutions as to where do we stand vis-a-vis -vis the global rankings. Because today, uh, it is the global ranking which will make a lot of difference uh, and we cannot be satisfied and happy with, with uh, where we are and how we rate ourselves, whether it is NAC or anything else. We don't have a credible system of ranking so far. So these, I think, are a few of the challenges and a couple of challenges of the education sector today. Thank you. Thanks a lot, sir. Uh, Professor Adrian Vajpayee would like to give uh, the viewpoint from a state university perspective. Hindi uh, मुझे अच्छा लगा यहाँ पे आकर कि वो सबसे बड़ी चुनौती जो हमारे हायर एजुकेशन सिस्टम के लिए है जो होल वो एकदम से दो सिस्टम्स हमारे सामने दिखाई पड़ते हैं एक तो जो कॉर्पोरेट कल्चर से जुड़ा हुआ हायर एजुकेशन है जिसमें कि हम सब लोग यहाँ पर बैठे हुए हैं बात कर रहे हैं और दूसरा जो इंडियन कल्चर से जुड़ा हुआ हायर एजुकेशन सिस्टम है दोनों को कैसे हम कन्वर्ज कैसे कर सकते हैं दोनों में एक रूपता कैसे लाई जाए तो हम भारतवर्ष को पूरे भारतवर्ष की हैसियत से ही देखेंगे आ, खाली एक इंडस्ट्री का पर्सपेक्टिव लेकर के ही चलें वो बात नहीं बन पाएगी और इन विश्वविद्यालयों को उनके हालत पर ही छोड़ दें वो बात जो है बन नहीं पाएगी सबसे बड़ी बात जो समझने की है हमको कि एजुकेशन जो है वो पूरी इकोनॉमी का एक हिस्सा है इसको अलग करके हम नहीं देख सकते तो इकोनॉमी की ग्रोथ और एजुकेशन की ग्रोथ में एक पैरिटी हमको देखनी पड़ेगी एंड देर वज टू बी सम फंक्शनल रिलेशनशिप ऑफ एजुकेशन विज ए विज इकोनॉमी सोसाइटी पॉलिटी टेक्नोलॉजी एग्रीकल्चर लाइक द डिफरेंट सेक्टर्स ऑफ द इकोनॉमी दैट इज नॉट इज सी गेटिंग एस्टेब्लिश्ड मे बी वी सी अवर यूनिवर्सिटीज प्रोफेसर रिसर्चर्स मे बी एट फार्ट और मे बी अवर इंडस्ट्रीज माई नॉट मे है माइंडसेट फॉर बहुत तो एक फंक्शनल रिलेशनशिप इस्टेब्लिश करने की बहुत जरूरत है और जब ये इसको एज ए मोटो हम स्वीकार कर लेंगे तो बहुत सारी चीजें जो हम पहले भाई साहब जो लेक्चर दे रहे थे जो लेक्चर से आप हुए हैं वो सारी चीजें जो है वो ठीक हो जाएंगी देखिए जब प्रॉफिट की बात आती है तो उसमें भी हमारे पास में दो सिस्टम्स लगे हुए हैं जितने समझिए हमारे प्राइवेट पार्टनर्स हैं हमारे एजुकेशन में और उस पर भी, भी जो जो आपके इंजीनियरिंग और मेडिकल और मैनेजमेंट के जो एजुकेशन वाले हैं उन्होंने तो आ, अपने इंस्टीट्यूशन खोली ही हैं प्रॉफिट के लिए वो उसके बगैर चल नहीं सकती हैं और जो हमारी स्टेट यूनिवर्सिटीज हैं वो समझिए वेलफेयर के लिए आ, काम कर रही हैं हम अपनी यूनिवर्सिटी जिसके मैं वाइस चांसलर हूँ पिछले चार सालों से यदि दो रुपए की फीस बढ़ाता हूँ तो वहां पर आंदोलन होने लगते हैं और उसके ही समकक्ष जो दूसरी प्राइवेट यूनिवर्सिटी है उनसे कई गुना अधिक फीस चार्ज कर रही है वहां पर वो चो भी नहीं कर रहे हैं तो एक ये भी बहुत बड़ा चैलेंज हमारे सामने आया है कि हमें एक मैक्रो परस्पेक्टिव डेवलप करना पड़ेगा इंडिया एज ए होल के लिए अन्यथा क्या होगा जैसे कि हम रीजन के हिसाब से जोग्राफी के हिसाब से कल्चर के हिसाब से क्लास के हिसाब से अलग अलग सिस्टम डेवलप करने लगेंगे तो मुझे लगता है कि दिक्कत हो जाएगी एक चैलेंज बहुत बड़ा ये भी आ रहा है हमारे सामने कि जितने प्रोफेशनल कोर्सेज जिसकी बात हमने कही है इनमें एमबीबीएस को छोड़कर बाकी इसमें विद्यार्थी नहीं आ रहे अब लाभ समझिए अच्छी उनको एजुकेशन दें अच्छी शिक्षा दें अच्छा करिकुला है सब कुछ अच्छी टेक्नोलॉजी है तब भी स्टूडेंट्स आर नॉट गेटिंग एटिटेड वो भी चीज हमको देखनी पड़ेगी और सबसे बड़ा चैलेंज क्या हायर एजुकेशन क्या हायर एजुकेशन का उद्देश्य सिर्फ जो है हम विद्यार्थियों को इंडस्ट्री के लिए बनाना ही है कि कुछ रिसर्च करना भी है हमारा जो कॉन्सेप्ट है हायर एजुकेशन का स्पेशली इंडिया में स्पेशली जो स्टेट यूनिवर्सिटी जो हम लोग हैं वो रिसर्च पर हम लोगों ने ज्यादा ध्यान दिया है और आप तो आपको आश्चर्य जान करके स्टडीज बता रही सिक्सटी टू सेवेंटी परसेंट जो रिसर्च हुई है इंडिया में वो आपके समझिए कि आई टी जायम से कम हमारी जो स्टेट यूनिवर्सिटी ओरिजिनल रिसर्चेज है वो हमारी स्टेट यूनिवर्सिटीज ने करके प्रदान किए हैं जिस पर भी 
और रिसर्च यदि सही ढंग से नहीं हो पाएगी तो समझिए उसके बाद में टेक्नोलॉजी कैसे होगी बेसिक रिसर्च तो हमारे बेसिक सब्जेक्ट से हुई जो भाई साहब बता रहे थे फॉरेन का उदाहरण दे रहे थे उन्होंने बेसिक यूनिवर्सिटी बंद करके कॉम्पिटेंस सेंटर को दिया ये कॉम्पिटेंस सेंटर क्या करेंगे आप वो अच्छी बॉडी बनाकर अच्छा माइंड बनाकर माइंड सेट बनाकर जब दे देंगे लेकिन जो बेसिक रिसर्चेस नहीं होंगी बेसिक पढ़ाई लिखाई नहीं होगी कॉन्सेप्ट नहीं क्लियर होंगे थेरीज लोगों के पास में नहीं होंगी तो आगे जाकर के बात कैसे बन पाएगी हम उस सेक्टर को भी नेग्लेक्ट नहीं कर पाएंगे तो हमारा तो ये सोचना है कि भाई जो भारतवर्ष है भारतवर्ष में हायर एजुकेशन है वी शुड नॉट इग्नोर इंडिया सो फार एज डेवलपिंग मॉडल ऑफ हायर एजुकेशन और भारतवर्ष की जो है अपनी एक परंपरा रही है हायर एजुकेशन की आप बताइए कोई भी ऐसा समझिए कि बेसिक ज्ञान नहीं है जो कि भारतवर्ष ने विश्व ज्ञान को न दिया हो मैं कहता हूँ शून्य से लेके अनंत तक जितने भी विषय होते हैं सब भारत ने दिए हैं उनको हमने इग्नोर कर दिया सबसे बढ़िया लिटरेचर दिया और लिटरेचर में भी साइंस ने सोशल साइंस दी गुरु ग्रंथ साहब का आप पारायण करिए उसमें आपको बाय टेक्नोलॉजी के लेटेस्ट समझिए फॉर्मूले हमारे गुरु ग्रंथ साहब मिलते हैं उस चीज को कौन पढ़ाएगा कालिदास को कौन पढ़ाएगा भवभूति को कौन पढ़ाएगा हम कहते हैं शेक्सपियर को कौन पढ़ाया कीट्स को कौन पढ़ाया जो हमारी फाइन आर्ट परफॉर्मिंग आर्ट जो पूरे समझिए समाज में अच्छे व्यक्तित्व के निर्माण करने की आवश्यकता होती है वो चीज एक चैलेंज और जो बहुत ही महत्वपूर्ण उस पर भी चर्चा हम करना चाहिए हम स्टेट यूनिवर्सिटी से मॉडल हमारे सामने है इसमें वो एक माइंड सेट का मैं कल अपनी बजट की मीटिंग ले रहा था अपनी यूनिवर्सिटीज में पता था सारे डिपार्टमेंट्स पे साइंस सब्जेक्ट्स के तो डिपार्टमेंट अच्छा काम कर रहे हैं लेकिन जो आर्ट्स और ह्यूमैनिटीज के सोशल साइंस डिपार्टमेंट्स हैं ना वहाँ कोई लेक्चर देने की आ रहा है ना उनको बुलाया जा रहा है ना कोई रिसर्च प्रोजेक्ट ले रहे हैं एक ऐसी लेथार्जी आ गई है प्रोफेसर में तो उसके बारे में भी हमको सोचना पड़ेगा माइंड सेट टू बी उसी ट्रांसफॉर्म ट्यून्ड टूवर्ड्स इसी प्रोग्रेसिव थिंकिंग उसके बारे में सोचना पड़ेगा दीज आर इसी फ्यू थिंग विच आई वॉन्ट टू जस्ट शेयर थैंक यू थैंक यू डॉक्टर साहब जो प्रोफेसर वाजपेयी ने जो बातें कही लगभग वही बातें ये जो कैंपस प्रिपेयरनेस सर्वे में चहू और से निकल के आ रही हैं जिसको हमने बहुत ही इंटरेस्टिंग इंफोग्राफिक्स में प्रस्तुत किया है विभिन्न विविध आयाम जो कि शिक्षा के प्रति और हायर एजुकेशन के प्रति जो पूरे देश में है अक्रॉस वेरियस जॉनरेज ऑफ इंस्टीट्यूशन वेरी वेल प्लेस सर आई वु नाउ रिक्वेस्ट प्रोफेसर डॉक्टर आर एल शर्मा टू गिव अप हिज ओपनिंग रिमार्क्स ऑन द टॉपिक Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to share my thoughts with this was gathering over here. In fact, uh, I have come over here uh, in search of a solution, which I am always trying to find out. And every time, this is leading us. As far as as far as the demand from the students is concerned i think that you very much clear what the student want what the uh, uh, various stakeholders want from the university or from the higher education that is very clear that is they want quality education at maybe low cost which can guarantee them a which can guarantee them a future so this this is the crux that is the student want and he will go extra mile wherever he will get these things whether he gets it here he will come here if he gets these things in other country alien countries you definitely go to the alien countries um, i will be telling i will be talking from the perspective that is what we, which is uh, prevailing right now um, at the ground level i think we have already passed through a phase which us or america went after the industrialization which happened over there when the industrialization happened there were lot of infrastructural activities which took place as a result there was a lot of demand for jobs as a result a lot many institutions came over there but those institutions maybe because one or reason or other or maybe because of the better policies those institutions survived india went through the same phase i think after the opening of this economy in 1990 onward i think so many companies lot many companies came to india lot many infrastructure projects came to india that is still being executed as a result there was a large demand for the 
professionals or the skilled people over here. I think it is because of that that is India witnessed a large number of technical institutions. I will be talking from technical perspective only. Technical institutions and large number of professional universities in our country. I think everybody knows that is there is something like 37,000 college higher educational institutions. There are some something like 700 universities in our country. But if you see today, I think after 15 years, we are talking about that is what to do with those institutions. I think in the opening remarks also you said that is I think there is a need to scrap those and establish these institutions from the new perspective. I think that may, maybe uh, it is a point of debate that is how to go. And as we talk about the universities, I think you know what is the fate of the universities. Where our universities stand today, if you see from the perspective of university rankings, there may be flaw in the ranking system itself, all those rankings are carried out. But still, in spite of all those things, these are widely accepted. And it will stay also. But where our universities stand, everybody knows. Either we don't pursue it properly, that is how we have to compete, or we don't take it seriously. Either of these two things are there. But I think you know, we know that is where we stand. Same thing is about the higher educational colleges, which are there, 37,000 so in the other country. Uh, I think about 6.5 lakh professional students, I am talking about the professionals, they pass out from these institutions every year. And I think I just heard that is one fourth, this is true, are only employable. Rest of the people, they need retraining in order to make them worthy for jobs. They run after the menial jobs. They don't get even the menial jobs, small jobs. So this is the status of those institutions. I think what happened is there are two types of institutions. One is government institutions, another is private institutions. I'm seeing these things in Himachal Pradesh also because large number of institutions and universities are there. People still have the faith in government institutions. Of course, these are small in number. All the seats are filled up. <coughs> Irrespective of whether the faculty is there or other things are there, because everything is not proper also. But all the seats are filled up. There is a large number of private institutions. Students are not going there over there. Professor Bajpi also told the same thing. Why they are not going there? It doesn't mean that the demand for education has gone down. <coughs> demand for education has not gone down. Education, I think everybody knows, education is the one thing which will always remain, which will be needed by each and everybody. So there is no, I think, as far as the demand is concerned, there is no let down or there is no decrease in the demand. They say, I think these developed countries need something like four crore jobs by 2020. But the one reason is why the people, why the students have lost faith in the private sector, because they didn't invest. They just started the institutions and forget the end results. They simply enrolled the students. I think one remark which I heard in the beginning is, that is these institutions, professional institutions or higher educational institutions, they must run like or they must run this institution like an industry. What happens is when the industry is started by somebody, they first look for the market where the product will be sold, where the product can be sold. And unless you don't run these educational institutions like that, that is what courses I am going to run, which students, how many students I am going to enroll, and where those students can be fitted in what type of job they can get after suspending say a couple of years in the institutions, I think we cannot succeed. In the beginning I said that the aspirations of the students is they are willing to spend time, they are willing to spend money, but they want quality education which can ensure them a proper job after spending a couple of years, spending a lot of money. So we are not able to provide those things 
to these students. There is a disparity also between the central and the institutions. I think the most of these educational institutions which are in these states, that is with the government. Government is controlling over those institutions. There are some good institutions, of course, which are in the central sector. There is a lot of funding for these institutions. Good faculty is there. And all those things are existing. And because of that, they are performing well. There are ample opportunities for the faculty also available in those institutions, because of which they can conduct research. They can make their career also better. It is not only to teach the students. They also think about their career, because their career is associated with the research and other activities. So they will also, faculty will also go only to those institutions which offer this type of facilities. If it is not there, I think no faculty will go and always we will be speaking that the faculty is not available. Faculty is available, they are going to other countries, but they are not finding those ambience and other facilities which we can provide. We always talk about the industry institution interactions. Industry is not coming. Industry will definitely come in case they find out that is there is somebody, there is some institution where our problem could be solved. They will definitely come. They are going to some of the institutions which have the capabilities, for example, say QIITs and other uh, research organizations. And vice versa, this educational institution has also to go to the industry, they have to visit. I don't know how many people go to the industries and say, we have got these facilities, kindly tell us what we can do for you. So I, I think these are lots, I think they are, these are the issues which I think we have to find out a solution. Unless and until we don't find out the solution to these real problems which are there, I think we will be always talking about all those things. Thanks a lot, sir. Thank you very much. May I uh, ask, yeah. add to whatever the yeah. sir, just, panelists? Just our closing remarks, closing, and right. then uh, we'll just bring you in. Uh, the last speaker on the panel, Mr. Kumara Guru, uh, giving uh, his perspective on the topic, building it for uh, further. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for inviting me <coughs> this afternoon uh, to this uh, wonderful forum. I just want to uh, sort of use this occasion to set the context that we all uh, sort of do know, but I think it's important to sort of just recap the context. I think we live in a country where every month roughly about one million youth enter the workforce, right? And that's a very important fact. And you know, I say this very conscious that you know we have fewer industry people on the panel than the people from the academic sector, because ultimately that is the primary reason that students come into the higher education sector because they want a good career. And I do want to say that even if it is about entering into research or academic, it still is a career pursuit that people come into the education sector in the, at the end of the day. So that's a large work, uh, numbers that are entering the workforce. Now, we live in a country which is very diverse. You know, we're talking of, you know, this state, uh, city is the capital of two states, we're talking of 18 official languages, many states. But two uh, sort of data points which talk of our demographic profile, right? One is about 52% of our country's population right now is the, below the age of 25. About 65% of our population is below the age of 35. The median age of this country in 2020 is forecasted to be 28 years of age. And with the cross enrollment ratio that we're currently looking at, which is a shade over 20%, we're actually not looking at a very, very bright sort of higher education scenario at this point. And we have a very wide representation on the panel here, uh, representing state, private universities, private institutions, and all those uh, sort of different players in the field. Uh, and I think, therefore, if you want to have an impact in a country like India, the most important thing is you need to have size. I think size is very much important for you to have an impact. Scale does matter. So I'm going to talk about five challenges and one challenger, the way I see it uh, for the higher education sector in India. One, uh, let's talk of regulation. I'm going to just throw out five points and we can sort of discuss those things when we come into the Q&A session. I think we live in a country where the higher education sector is highly regulated. You know, I think I heard, uh, you know, Professor Majumdar of uh, Symbiosis uh, speak at the FIKI conference a few years ago. 
where he said that the uh, you know Lakshmi, the goddess of wealth in India, uh, you know, was liberalized in '91. But he said Saraswati has never been liberalized. Right? You know, higher education sector is completely controlled. So if you look at regulation, we have a regulatory system which is more control oriented as opposed to growth oriented. That's one aspect of it. Uh, second aspect is look at the same thing if you just extend, and I'm going back to the quality point of it, which is in the theme. You have an approval based mechanism in India as opposed to what is a more desirable form, which is the accreditation based system. Right? So, for example, your regulatory bodies in India, whichever uh, bodies that you are referring to be the MCI, DCI, AICT, all those uh, different bodies, they tell you the floor. They tell you that if you want to start a university, you need to have X number of, you know, X square feet of campus, the, the library with so many books, you need to have a director's residence, the director needs to have a landline connection, etc., etc. That's what is prescribed, which is an approval based mechanism. Accreditation is a relatively newer concept. I mean, when I say relatively newer, it's over a decade and a half. But still, the number of institutions of the, you know, 7,000 odd colleges or the number of colleges that we spoke of, versus the number of accredited colleges, there's a huge gap. And I think that's the other big challenge for this country in higher education system. Let's talk of faculty members. I think you have a large number of faculty members, and I'm using this in the higher education context. I think the question to ask ourselves is, are we teachers or are we facilitators? And this goes back to the uh, whole thing of faculty centricity versus student centricity. This goes back to newer sort of methodologies that you're seeing of flipped classroom model that is being uh, you know introduced in classrooms. This is you know goes back to some of the opening remarks we heard from Raj and Raghu and others about how technology is playing a key role. What and a whole bunch of things. I think that's a, that's the third sort of challenge for us. The fourth one is about sort of somewhat related to the ranking remarks that some of my colleagues on the stage just mentioned. Most of the international rankings play a large amount of emphasis on research that takes place in the higher education institutions. Uh, roughly about 40% uh, on an average. That's a large number of, uh, large amount of weightage. Unfortunately, in India, we are, we are primarily known as institutions where we disseminate knowledge as opposed to create knowledge. Uh, there's a huge sort of gap or the huge distinction that we need to recognize. We have some of the best teachers in the classroom. Our students go on to become some of the best leaders, some of the best graduates. But where do most of our best students go? They invariably end up going abroad, a large number of them still, to pursue their PhD or doctoral programs. And that's true for engineering sciences, that's true for management sciences, at least where I come from. I'm, you know, That's a field that I'm very familiar with. Large number of students graduate from Indian you know, the IITs or the NITs or any institution, really, then go on to do their masters and their PhDs abroad and invariably become faculty members. If you, just on the B school thing, take a look at the top 50 B schools in the US, download their list of faculty. I wouldn't be surprised if about 30% of their top faculty are all actually Indian origin faculty members, right? And these are very celebrated, uh, sort of published author, uh, you know, faculty members whose papers are published and are researched and you know, sort of referenced, quoted in some of the leading sort of conferences and journals, and are who looked upon to as leading lights of knowledge. So that's another huge sort of focus area for us. The last one I would say as a challenger is actually uh, these are challenges that I was referring to is. In the traditional system of higher education that we are following right now, I would like us to think of what would be the challenge that would pose to us if the you know massive open online course, the MOOCs as it's popularly called, if it were to gain traction in a country like India, right? Uh, I'm not saying that they would replace the traditional setup of the institutions and the role of the faculty member in the classroom. But I do think it's important for all of us in the higher education space to recognize that MOOCs probably will be a huge challenger to the way we traditionally conduct higher education sort of institutions, be it in terms of administration, research, teaching, and student experience. That's uh, my sort of set of challenges and the challenges to this. Thing. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Guru. Uh, our entire panel has somewhere, this is the Gagar Mein Sagar Badana, the complex topic. Ko. I think from foundational fountains, uh, what uh, Professor Indian Vajpayee said, and that's where our next session would lead on to. 
what is the functional relationship between higher education or the higher technical education the structural relationship between academy and the industry which is perhaps lacking and uh, merging with the national priorities which many of our senior uh, panelists from drdo and navy and air force who are present uh, today uh, and who will be talking about the next panel so this is uh, one of the linkages and the context which uh, kumaraguru has set in and uh, finance has been brought out both by dr modi and uh, obviously uh, dr sharma ki where the finance uh, high technical education has to be run by an industry i would now open the forum uh, uh, to captain surup uh, to give up to comment and ask questions to the panelists and we can take it forward can i have the mic yeah sure mic can please from dit university taradun uh, we talked about uh, <coughs> faculty efficiency we talked about infrastructure we talked about placement we talked about uh, research what is more important which we are giving stress on is communication skills which i think uh, the panelist uh, didn't touch upon and which i feel is an important organ if you can be a good engineer you can be a good professional if you are not able to communicate yourself i fail to understand how you are going to succeed in your life and i must admit this when the placement people they come to us the main criteria on which they comment on is the communication skills they are not able to express i am not i am not saying that you should be good in english communication skill means any language for that matter second question which we talked about is industrial know how for that purpose as far as dit university is concerned we are having conclave of industrial uh, people so that before we finalize our curriculum or syllabus we hear them and we change the syllabus accordingly so this is what we are planning to do and we are successful in doing it we have done so many conclaves and we intend doing it in future also thirdly i beg to differ from one of the panelists who said who made a categorical command that private universities people are not going their their uh, their the uh, students are not approaching them because sufficient knowledge sufficient the staff is not there they are not able to express themselves i beg to differ from you sir uh, respectfully because as far as dit university is concerned i must tell you that we are not running short of any student in our university in fact you will be surprised to know that we have made a benchmark of 65% minimum percentage in 12th standard to get into dit we believe in quality not the quantity and we have to open and in fact i must uh, tell you one more thing that we are our university is very much there in je main counseling and from there also i have insisted while i am signing the agreement i insisted those officials that listen he might be having any position but if he is not following into that benchmark that is 65% in 12th standard he will not be admitted to dit university that's the reason we are progressing and we are insisting on not only english we have uh, have got a league with cambridge university to teach our students english we have got spanish we have got german etc so that we can compete with the present day scenario and dit is doing very well and that's the reason i thought i was you know bubbling to say all this and interfered i'm sorry uh, before the panelists could speak i wanted to say all this and thank you very much for uh, giving us such a, a wide uh, knowledge and we will definitely look into it and we'll pro progress in those lines only thank okay, you very much uh, to keep the comment short because we will be trying to compile all that and these diverse voices uh, certainly are covered across yeah please yeah i agree you know and you know i don't know how we but i just want to leave one uh, point here which i missed in my comment what is very critical we have lots of areas which we need to cover up to make sure we get closer to the excellence it's very important in our institutions be it private or be it government run institutes to create a scientific environment to create a modern organizations you know what i mean by modern organization is not about you know having great you know buildings or something when i talk about modern modern organization i mean to say and an a mix of scientific environment and a, a good layer of humanity 
what sir said. So a mixture of good humanity and mix it with the, and create the scientific environment and then it is a beautiful coverage of technology because that is the need because as, as I said the market is extremely demanding. You know at one point of time companies had a lot of leverage to pick up mediocres. Today we don't have. We, we look for the best. So I think that was one message. So no, no, nothing against the private universe. Thanks. Sir. No, no, no. I never said that. Yep. You no, are I'm against the private universe. <laughs> <team. laughs> yeah. So, uh, good evening, sir. One rural area that is uh, Palwal and uh, NGF Engineering College. We are now. I intend to ask the <coughs> learned people here one basic thing. Perhaps uh, Mr. Bajpayee has hinted. Uh, to that aspect, my point is, are we, are we simultaneously getting aware of one very important factor that on the one side we are creating engineers and creating students who are from a very higher class of education. You know, they are the students, even their parents right prior to their birth make conscience about their career, about the scheme and all that. That is one section of the society. The other is, till 10th class, they are being promoted without any exams. You might be knowing it, the latest trend is, and what we are seeing at Bihar, is uh, available on national TV channel. Now, if that sort of gap which is going on, so fast and so big gap, which is the point where one day we are going to bridge it, please give a thought to this. This is my question as well as the point. Uh, maybe we can take a couple of questions and then respond. Uh, sir, please. Traveling with one uh, Chinese professor who is a uh, professor of Shanghai University. <coughs> so just uh, we were discussing the education system of India. What he brought out is, he says, your government is investing heavy amount of money in that education system. The world class private institutes, of course are business, but they are opening up good colleges. The civil, civilians and the population are eager and they are urged to make their children uh, educated and uh, trying to send them abroad. But the system is not working basically because they are all theory based. They are not applying the applied science. A electrical engineer, he passes out but he doesn't know how a electrical motor works because he never sees it. They are not investing in the laboratories, they are not investing in workshops, they are not getting a chance to go and get a practical knowledge. And then he told something, and which I don't know, but he translated in English. He said, you read, you forget. You see, you believe. But you do it, you remember throughout your life. That's what we're missing in India. And except for the computer science students of Indian, no other um, uh, students of any other faculty of engineering are doing well abroad. In, in, uh, computer science basically because of purely mind, and that chap, uh, whatever he's doing is uh, programming is fantastically suits and uh, gets a, uh, absorbed in any of the units. So just I wanted to know, uh, this, uh, this while that uh, engineering watch and campus management has given really uh, kind of made a process to make thinking into this one, higher education should we in introduce the applied science and make them uh, do the, the practicals so that they will be able to refine the uh, uh, process instead of uh, just only going as a uh, theoretical and becoming professors and uh, maybe in the academic field. fail to understand why the sciences and engineering are two different streams. You know, they shouldn't be two different streams. And when you go to universities, I am on a board of three, four, maybe about five universities, I really don't know why there are department silos. Why is a computer science department not working closely with the mathematics department? Why are this, they not one single department? I think that's why the practicality comes into the picture. This is a big, big, uh, you know, a gap, you know, on when it comes to the practicality, especially the applied sciences, especially how do you integrate sciences with the engineering and engineering with the sciences. I completely agree with you. Uh, I am Professor B.K. Kosla from Hematopolis University. 
you see we are at a today at a standing at a stage when us was 150 years ago they were also debating these issues like us we are sitting in this hall then a professor of chemistry from harvard college he gave me indication that in us you are teaching too much and you don't have the flexibility the concept of core courses foundation courses and the flexible electives came 155 years ago and the harvard then was built on that model they were going to close the college but today it is the best university so we have to wait we are 150 years back but the intentions are to be good i can tell you private universities can offer you a better platform because there is a flexible i have been a vice chancellor of a government university also the vice chancellor cannot do anything there is a private university somebody talk to the will power is the will is there anything can be done and at shuli university when i talk my turn comes i can talk about that then another thing which so far has not come though it directly it has come the practical skill development last last year i was in uk i was in mauritius last to last year in the commonwealth uh, university conference everybody all institutions all my chairs were talking about the skill development everybody was saying indian education is faulty their practicals their skill development they are very very poor except for the iits where some fairness is there so we have yet to involve skill development of our system and that there is a good opportunity ugc has started bbop with 300 hours of uh, coaching teaching and practical you have the diploma course another 3 hour 300 hours and you have the advanced diploma and another 300 hours you have the degree so in 900 hours along with the degree program you can give them the bbop degree and make them employable and you can meet the deficiency of the skilled worker thank you very much uh, the ranking is going to fall down you don't bother about ranking ranking will come automatically but first you have to give the best inputs focus on research you see our examination system is faulty we go in for a set of questions answers and then we say whether the student is topper or is not a topper i think the evaluation system needs to be changed some students are sent to industry for the sandwich training i'm sorry to point out even my company does that we invite students we tell them aapka attendance lagega andar nahi aane ka certificate lijiye jaiye because no faculty comes to follow up with us no faculty comes and really takes interest in those students they are just left there on their own most of us you know in our indian context we believe in two things copying and jugaad system <laughs> what are we talking about research and development the original thinking has to come in we need to give them how to you know think creatively how to think innovatively then i think everything will improve the ranking of the nation as a knowledge your society will go up on its own thanks a lot sir so would you please uh, introduce yourself for the sake of the whole uh, hr head for uh, public sector company yes, who's an engineer in the just one benchmarking some good points could be in the private universities also so collaboration is very very important the second thing which i just want is that industry interaction that is there should be uh, round table conferences with the industry that wherever we are situated at least what is important is the university wherever they are situated in those areas they should help the small and medium enterprises what happens that we should take the students and the teachers the regular round table conferences should be organized so that we can see we are carrying out the research in japan in usa about the usa and i am not doing the research which is surrounding my near areas my focus has been that the research should be focused in the universities nearby exactly. that we should try to focus on those areas so that the universities are embedded in those regions and they should try to solve the problems of those areas and the third thing which i just want is that there should be provision that the teacher should go to the industry that's very very important if the teachers are not going to the universities how can we know that what are the feel of the industry what they are looking for so i think these are the three points and the last is i particularly feel that evaluation system if i change my evaluation system to a great extent my most of the problems are going to be solved so these are some of my suggestion thank you thanks a lot sir we in university may be very good i talk with you for having all the things but uh, you know that all the private universities are not like that 
No, no, actually, 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 we as a theoretician give a generalized viewpoint. Right. Isn't it? Yeah. And as a separate general of our association of Indian universities for eight months, you see, I was there. I know the function of all the state centered team to be private university. So, private universities also will have to come forward to have some welfare orientation also. Mm -hmm. And similarly, state universities should also come for some efficiency parameters they have to see develop. So, one comment on that. For you see, then uh, uh, Professor was mentioning about that to see rural and uh, urban gaps. As well. I think that we cannot leave a higher education system to the market forces. Effective planning is required. <coughs> Without effective planning, you see, this uh, gap cannot be, you see, bridged, which is essential. We cannot leave, you see, a major portion of India just uh, at their feet only. And when we say that a demand-driven, you see, higher you know, demand-driven does not mean the purchasing power-driven. Demand does not mean only purchasing power in the, uh, in the exact sense which economics teaches. There should be necessity given, you see, higher education also. When necessity is there in the rural area, who will cater to the requirements of the rural population? That I do agree with you. Third point which Mr. Raj Shekhar was making. So it's a wonderful point, I think. Uh, I do agree with the complementarity between theory and practice. And one experiment we did at Chitraput, Gramode University, where I was the vice chancellor for some time. You see, we had a big form for us. For agriculture, we started agriculture, you see, engineering department. And agriculture economics, every economics used to go for agriculture purpose. Agriculture required some of the tractors and engineering department to, to provide all the implements. Then you see veterinary sciences also there. So theory is being taught in the classroom, and now all the students and you see uh, teachers had to go, you see, for, for, for practical purpose over there. That's a complete model. If that model is, uh, you see, replicated in different, you see, the disciplines. I think things can be see better. But simple theory won't uh, solve the purpose, and simply practicing won't see solve the purpose. There should be happy blending of the theory as a practice. Then only we can do the good side. Thanks. And another thing I would like to mention: when I mean, uh, Modi was mentioning that, you see, our uh, institution doesn't rank among the top 200 university of the world. You see, I say that name any university in the world which does not have contribution of Indians. You, 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 you told him so. Isn't it? This is uh, the mindset, the infrastructure, the facility. Here in India, we don't work. And <laughs> outside, we cannot survive without one. So, work pressure also is improved. I think it is good. Uh, certainly improved. Thank you very much. Yeah, please, Dr. Sharma. I'm sorry. Uh, if I've hurt somebody's feeling, uh, <laughs> exceptions are always there. Exceptions are always there, and uh, that is there. When you have come over here, I'm hearing from DIT, I think if it is there and practicing excellence, I think you are bound to uh, Sorry, succeed. No, no heartburn, sir. No, sir. <laughs> See, when you have come over here, Professor Kosla has come over here, that is the hallmark of your intentions, good intentions that you want to improve. Why I said this is, Maybe some iota of truth is there. Unless and until you don't speak the truth, unless and until you don't know the truth, you will never find out the solution. Right. You will be always, while we are talking about the that is challenges in higher education because we have a problem somewhere. And we, we have to find out those solution to those problems if the truth will come out. I think this is, I have been going to so many institutions seeing they are purchasing a lot of equipment, lathes and other things. They lock the put those things in the lab and lock it from outside. That is, I think, these challenges, how those things are to be properly utilized, I think this is where the engineering watch can play a role. If they can find out where the expertise lies, where the things are there, where the industry can also go and collaborate somehow so that we can improve upon, we can contribute something to the students or to the public. Thank I you, Dr. That is why I said this. Dr. Modi, uh, One small comment. Uh, we spoke about uh, encouraging application. I think the board doesn't stop here. Uh, we have to cultivate a lot higher order thinking skills, which uh, starting from memory to understanding to application, you have to go on to uh, analysis and evaluation and creation also, which nowhere come into the picture. I think uh, this mindset has to change. One, 
Two is that we keep on, in our education system, we keep on lowering our standards. We are Indians are very emotional people. The moment student comes and says, oh, I had this problem, so I will pass it. So the teacher is very quick to respond. And if he is so good at his heart, then I have helped somebody. Actually, we end up tearing apart the entire education system. The credibility is lost. We give such high marks, raise the expectations of the student and the industry. He says, here is a 10 pointer. Here is something who is scoring 80%, 90%. And when he sees the performance, it is not up to the mark. So we have to make sure that we are rigorous in our academic standards. So these are the two additional points I want to make. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Guru, uh, no, I, I don't have any remarks specifically, but I do think that you know we discuss a lot of these things at these sort of uh, you know, platforms. But I think a lot of effort can be done by ourselves, that is our own institutions taking that one step because you know especially the most I actually think the much abused sort of concept in this entire discussion is this industry institute interaction. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> attends I think in, the, you know, in their career they would have gone to about 100 industry institute interaction seminars, workshops. So institute says industry is not doing, industry says institute is not doing. But I think nothing stops us whether be it an industry or an institute to take five things or four things that you want to do and you want to implement and actually showcase it as a sort of an excellent example. So I do think that it's important for us, whether private or sort of public universities, to be able to demonstrate some success and intent on our own part. So let us take that first step, and then really nothing will stop us from doing what we want. Thank you, Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, party comments uh, invest. I mean, all you need to do, you know, Take out about three to four percent of your budget from your infrastructure budget, your buildings and your roads and cars and buses. Take up that four or five percent of your budgets from there and put that into the academics, which is your heart of your business. Which means hire good faculty. If you throw peanuts, you get monkeys. So that's one message. <laughs> this, the, the second message is from the which up, you know, from the from the industry side. I mean, when we as an industry want good people, we don't want to participate. Our participation with the education institute is only limited to the final, final year of internship when they come in. That's where the relationship starts. That's actually too late. And this is a question, this is a challenge back to the industry. That's too late. My suggestion is that it should be at a, at a very early level, early adoption level, maybe at a third semester. When the industry comes into the uh, to the institute and adopts about 50 candidates, that does not mean that they hire those 50 or 100 candidates. At a very at, at a very initial level, about third or fourth semester, they go and adopt these 100, 200 candidates and work with those students for next two to three years. The last six months is more of a brush, in the last minute brush. Doesn't happen. Adopt those students, work with them for next two two and a half years from maybe third or fourth semester. That includes visits of the industry, this, the, the, the faculty from uh, the university comes into the industry, the faculty from industry goes back to there. It is end of the end of the day of the same ecosystem. I mean, if I want a great set of talent, I also need to invest in this new ecosystem. Else, you know, we are going to two different directions. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, just one minute. Yeah, please, please, sir. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry it is ill mannered to speak when the panel has closed the things. And sadly, slightly because I'm sitting next to my service person, he's Navy, I'm from Army. Uh, I'm now recently at university, I think close to visiting of where Dr. Modi is there. I'm from a university called Sadhav Bhaksi University. He mentioned about excellence that admitting students only were 65%. There I have a perception that what happens to those who are below 65%. You know, we see how the percentage comes uh, once somebody mentioned, I won't like to mention the state, but how the marks come, there is a different. Our like mission says, you know, uh, to uh, uh, make the students acquire knowledge and lead a happy, sexual and meaningful life. I think a MBA, going to Harvard and MBA becoming a sarpanch in a Rajasthan village, that girl, I think I treat that as more meaningful life. So we should look into the little uh, rural aspects of the thing where people can't get uh, entrance into higher levels, but still come out as very good citizens and uh, do, as Dr. Sir said, uh, do good to the most of the population in the country, which is still in the villages. Thank you. Thanks a lot, sir. Uh,
fountains can be looked aside where the original thinking there had been a talk and where dr vajpayee also said that where those foundational things will come if we don't read or we don't go back to our philosophical foundations and there are practical uh, uh, prescriptions and practical challenges as well what kumar guru also said that the demographic pressures uh, which are which the polity and the economy and and what mr zahu said Uh, that the market is getting demanding and challenging all the more uh, the test uh, the speed for change so with these uh, fantastic opening and the closing remarks uh, the first session i think it has presented a, a, a galaxy of views and thought processes which you will be compiling and bringing out a white paper on it as well uh, from these higher education forums i would request uh, 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 mohit to present the zonal abstract of uh, north northern zone uh, to all the panelists and uh, simultaneously we request gaurav to distribute it across uh, to all our audience out here we would go uh, for its explanation and a bit of uh, uh, analysis of it at a later date but i would request mohit to just present it to all the panelists so i would just unravel it uh, the industry demands and uh, you know what we uh, give to the or be impart to the student maybe uh, during our university university curriculum are they updated at the same pace uh, at which the industry grows there is a gap there is a gap in the course curriculum in the syllabi are they regularly updated at the same pace with which the technology grows which with the industry makes changes so there is a gap between the pace of the two things thanks uh, so we will uh, put this question to the next panel uh, which is for our next panel we are just moving forward uh, well noted sir thanks a lot uh, i will thank all the panelists uh, on the first session of ours for their splendid contributions and a wide spread stuff